right, good morning, everybody. Good morning to everyone who's joining us online and in our access venue. Super to uh, all be together here this morning. And great to be back with you all after time being away. Want to let you know uh, right off the bat that uh, just as a warning later on this morning, we're going to be doing a question and answer time. So a few times a year, we just do this, give people the chance to text in whatever questions that you want about God, faith, the Bible, Christianity, and uh, I'll take a crack at trying to answer those questions later on. There's a number that's going to come up on the screen here, and it'll be up during the whole message. So any questions that you want to have uh, answered, we'll take them uh, and uh, line them up and then uh, be able to do some question and answer at the end of the message this morning. Well, uh, for those of you who uh, don't know, uh, Kelly and I were gone in, uh, for the last week. We were in New York for our 25th wedding anniversary celebration. Yeah, thank you very much. So we had a great time. We were out there. Anyone else ever been to New York before? Yeah, a few people. Yeah, it was, uh, it was our first time there, and uh, it was absolutely a ball. And uh, New York's a fascinating place, especially the closer you get to Times Square, the more fascinating things get. You can just walk right out of uh, your room and you've got all kinds of ethnicities, you've got all kinds of languages, you've got all kinds of things that people are selling, you've got all kinds of weirdos right there in Times Square. For example, we could look, walk right out of our room and there you see like Elmo and his brother Melmo, you know, right side by side. You can tell Melmo because he's the one with the flesh hand, you know, the red fur doesn't cover his hand. And then you've got, uh, you know, Spider-Man was there, he hung out at Times Square and, uh, yeah, you got the bored Mickey Mouse and the headless Hello Kitty. And uh, I did not know Hello Kitty was, was headless there. But you got all kinds of crazy things there, and you've got a lot of religion, too. One of the things that we noticed as we walked around is that there's all kinds of people with varying agendas. There's Catholics there, and there's Protestants that are there. There are people who are Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Christian science, Scientology, a bunch of stuff we had never heard of walking around. There was one guy walking around with a sign, and actually it was a little group of people who were walking around with this sign, and it said, your opportunity for salvation ended in May of 2011. Prepare for judgment. It's like, wow, that's depressing, <laughs> you know. Good thing you brought that good news to Times Square. And it begs the question, it makes us ask the question, how do I know what's true? With all of these various groups that are out there making all kinds of supernatural claims, how do I know which ones are authentic faith and which ones are false faith? Because when you go, even go all the way back to the time of John, when he's writing 1 John, all the way today, there are always going to be cult groups and other religions that try and hijack Jesus for their own purposes. That they have kind of a version of the truth, but they spin it in such a way that it's really not faithful to the truth. And you got to ask yourself the question, how do I know? I think this is the primary agenda of John in his book, 1 John, is to give people three different tests by which they can determine whether or not faith is legitimate. And it's faith that could be applied, or tests that could be applied towards those cult groups that are out there. It's tests that could be applied to yourself, saying, how do I know if my faith is legitimate? Maybe you have a coworker who comes in and, you know, they're all exuberant about some kind of a brand of faith, but something just smells a little bit funky about what they're saying. You're trying to figure out, how do I figure it out for them? Or political candidates who always love to affiliate themselves with a particular brand of Christianity, and you're going, I don't know if there's any way to tell whether or not they're authentic in that. Well, the book of 1 John was written so that people will be able to know whether or not faith is authentic. And we'll be taking a look this morning at the three key tests that John gives. I call them the first John spiral. And uh, these are the three tests that uh, would be placed in this. So test number one is, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in all of the right things? As you read the whole book of 1 John, you'll notice that there are a number of passages that talk about people being in or out based on what they believe about Jesus. One example is from chapter 2, verse 22. It says this, Who is the liar? It's the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. And whoever acknowledged the Son has the Father also. You see, it's a little litmus test that's based on what you believe. And as you read through 1 John, you'll find a number of these litmus tests. 
John says that in order to have authentic faith, you have to truly believe in Jesus, that he's the Messiah, that he's God, that he came in the flesh. In fact, there are some pretty clear statements, not only in 1 John and the book of John, but all throughout the Bible that talk about the difference between authentic Christianity and other faiths that are out there. And uh, as you take a look at the kind of the whole of Scripture, you have to figure out what are some of those key belief tests. Because the truth about Christians is that there are oftentimes that Christians disagree with each other on legitimate issues. There are secondary issues that we don't have to put at the center of our faith. But there are some essentials that are out there that if you leave those essentials in the wake, it no longer is a Christian faith. So I've come up with seven. You can find these on our website as well. But they're kind of seven basics that you say, in order to really be authentic faith, you've got to be able to uh, believe these key things. So number one, God. God exists eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the doctrine of the Trinity, where there is one God who manifests himself as three persons. Second one is Jesus. Jesus himself is the promised Messiah. That means he's the one who is coming, the anointed one who is coming, who is promised through all the ages, and that he is both fully God and fully man. And there are a lot of cult groups over the years that have rejected one of these three key things about Jesus, and in so doing, they disqualify themselves from being authentically Christian. The Holy Spirit lives within all believers to teach and empower and guide. He is a real person, and he really exists as one of the persons of the Trinity. The Bible is the trustworthy and true communication from God. It's the authority for our life and our practice. Forgiveness was purchased once and for all by Jesus' death on the cross. The idea of all of humanity is a mess, but Jesus comes in order to bring forgiveness, and he exchanges his life for ours so that we might have his eternal life. New life, today and forever, assured by Jesus' bodily resurrection from the dead. The idea of eternal life is that it starts now and it lasts forever and Jesus' promise is going to be secure because he rose from the dead and he promised that we will rise from the dead as well, physically, bodily. Hope, hope is in the return of Jesus to usher in the kingdom of God in all of its fullness. That Jesus really is coming back again and when he comes back he's both going to judge and he's going to bring us home. These are seven of the key things that if you reject these basic orthodox statements, then you wind up being outside of the true Christian faith. And belief in the right things is critical. If you just take the belief test by itself, then it rules out a lot of the cults that are out there that would teach things that are opposite of these core tenets of the faith. But there's more than that because belief in and of itself is not enough. In fact, I know a lot of people out there who are great thinkers. They're Bible scholars. They've went to school for a long, long time. They maybe even teach in a university. And even though they have a huge amount of knowledge about the right things, they're not following Jesus. The Bible even says that Satan himself believes the right things about God, but he shudders in fear. He's a great theologian, but he's not following God. So there has to be something more than an intellectual ascension to the facts. Facts are your friends, facts are important, but there has to be more. So the next piece of the first John spiral is this. Number one, believe in Jesus. Number two, walk in the light. Or you could say, obey what God tells you. And this is what Sky was teaching us last week, the second of these three tests. So believe the right things and walk in the light. Because if your faith is authentic, then your beliefs are going to wind up landing in actions. Here's a verse from uh, 1 John that will uh, uh, help you understand that. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, or verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. Pretty straightforward. We know that we've come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anybody obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. And this is how we know that we are in him. Test number two is the obedience test. Are you increasingly allowing the light of God to so flood your life that the darkness flees and you become more and more and more like Jesus? 
As you enter into your relationship with God, he flushes out the darkness and helps you to be able to obey his commands. It's a critical piece of the puzzle. But it's not enough in and of itself. There are some problems that could take place if you do just one and two, but you don't have the third element that is in place there. Last week when we were in New York, we had the blessing of uh, being able to go to Tim Keller's Redeemer Presbyterian Church uh, on Sunday morning and hear him teach. He had some uh, good thoughts that were in his message that I'm going to steal from my message this morning. He says, look, if you've got these two things in place, right beliefs, And if you're trying to get really, really good at obsessing over the moral things that help you to obey God and follow his commands, there are two huge pitfalls that come with those things alone. One of those huge pitfalls is a sense of superiority. If you get all of your theological ducks exactly in a row, and if after putting all those in a row, you obsess over following all of the details, the rules, the laws, side by side, It becomes very easy to become proud and to become not just righteous, but to be self-righteous. This is the pitfall that the Pharisees fell into in Jesus' day. They were so obsessed with the rules that their hearts became far from God. And uh, some of you guys may be that kind of person. Some of you may have been around that kind of person. And it makes you flee in terror, doesn't it? You just don't want to hang out with that type of a person who they've got all the head knowledge right, even the obedience right, but they become self-absorbed. The other possibility, though, is a deep sense of inferiority. A deep sense of inferiority. And that comes from somebody who says, look, I'm taking an accurate look at all of the things the Bible teaches that we're supposed to do, and this is just impossible. Have you guys ever felt that way? If you haven't, then read the Sermon on the Mount. You'll walk away with a deep sense that this is hard. I know a little bit earlier this week, I was feeling that way. You know, I was in a prayer time and went to God with confession, and I found that my confession list was really long, especially things that I had left undone, things I knew that I should be doing that I just wasn't engaged in in my life right now. And I got to the end, and I felt exhausted with my inability to live according to all the ways that God wants me to live. It can leave you with, if you're left only with beliefs and rules, it can leave you with a deep sense of inferiority. I think that's why Mark Twain said, it's not the things I don't understand about the Bible that bother me. It's the things that I do understand about the Bible that bother me. Because when you understand it, you realize that this is really a high level of morality that we're supposed to follow. Maybe that's the reason why Mark Twain had so many dreams where the Bible was, uh, in his dream, flat on his chest and was so large and heavy that he could barely breathe. He was suffocated by this idea of inferiority under the commands of the Bible. And if this is all you do, that's a place where you could easily land. And once again, you go away screaming in fear or in terror. And there are many people who have left the church because all they see is the emptiness of the beliefs and the morality that go side by side. So what is the third test that would make all of these two complete? Well, the third test is found in our main text this morning, John chapter 3, beginning at verse 11, which starts off with this little command. For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Pretty simple. We should love one another. The third test is the love test. And I want to encourage you as you read through 1 John, I hope you guys have been following the challenge from the first week to read 1 John every day just to take a look at those five chapters. It'll take you only 15 or 20 minutes to do that. But this week, as you read through 1 John for yourself, I want you to watch for those three tests. Watch for the obedience test, watch for the belief test, and watch for the love test, and see what you can learn every day as you read through. Where are those tests? Highlight those tests as you go through uh, the book of 1 John. And you'll notice in this one, he says, for this is the message you heard from the beginning. And I think he's pulling out that phrase on purpose. You remember that phrase from John chapter 1, verse 1, where he said, that which is from the beginning, referring to Jesus. And that referred back to John chapter 1, verse 1, which talked about in the beginning was the Word. And that referred back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
What John is saying here by this little phrase is he's saying this principle of love has been there from the foundation of the world all the way from the beginning. It's in the character of the one who God sent to be the one who is a sacrifice for us. And it's clutch. It's critical to the Christian life. And those other two things, everything in the Christian life flows out of your relationship with God. If you don't have that deep heart-to-heart -heart relationship with God that extends itself in love to others, the other things become very empty. But if you do have it, it fuels everything that you do. So then you've got your three pieces. Believe in Jesus, walk in the light, and live in love. This is the spiral in 1 John. And these are the three tests that tell you how do you know that faith is authentic. Well, let's move on to our next uh, verse here, verse 12. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Well, because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Now, I know many of you know the story of Cain and Abel that comes from the fourth chapter of Genesis. Cain and Abel were the first two sons of Adam and Eve. And uh, there came a time for sacrifice, and Cain brought his sacrifice, and then Abel brought his sacrifice, which was the first and the best. And God found Abel's sacrifice of the first and the best more pleasing than Cain's sacrifice. And so Cain became insanely jealous of Abel, so much so that he wound up killing Abel because Abel was righteous and Cain was unrighteous. He was so jealous that he killed him. He murdered his own brother. Well, why does John bring this up at this point in the passage? Well, the reason is that Cain is somebody who could pass the first two tests. He had the right knowledge about God. You know, he was thinking clearly. He walked with God in the garden, talked to him personally. And Abel, well, I'm sorry, and the second test that he has, not only did he pass the belief test, he passes the obedience test at least somewhat. You know, he was kind of religious. He was at least bringing some sacrifices at the time. But where he fails is he fails the love test. He murdered his brother. And it's just a graphic example of how that happens. John's pointing out that you just can't have an authentic, deep connection to God and allow hate to brood deep in your system. When you make your home in God, when you abide in him, when you live in him, you can't help but become increasingly loving. And that's why this test is so important. So let's get really practical on this. How are you doing when it comes to the love test? How are you doing on the love scale? I mean, can you pass the Cain test? Has anybody here recently murdered their brother? Show of hands? No, don't show your hands. That would actually be pretty embarrassing. So, yeah, my guess is that nobody here has recently murdered their brother. You're passing the Cain test. That's a good thing. Kudos to you. But let me ask the next step deeper. How are you doing at loving your brother and sister? How are you doing at loving your brother and sister? And we'll just start with your family of origin, your real physical brother and sister. Do you love the brothers and sisters that were raised in the same home as you? I think God would encourage us to do that and for us to look deep in our hearts and say, are we loving towards the people that we were raised with? But I think John's exhortation is even a step deeper here. It includes our physical brothers and sisters. But when John talks about brothers and sisters over and over again, he's talking about brothers and sisters in the family of God. He's talking about how do you relate to people who are in the church are you loving towards people in the church or are you not so loving of the people in the church? For John, this Christian family is equally important. So let me ask, when you do an inventory of yourself, are you somebody who invests in students and kids here at Christ Community Church? If so, then awesome, you passed the love test. Are you somebody who connects in with a journey group that's here where you spend time every week or every other week growing deep in your relationship, loving and being loved, knowing and being known, spurring one another on to love and good deeds? If so, then awesome, you pass the love test. Are you somebody who shows up to church on Sunday morning and what's on your mind, what's on your agenda is, can I find somebody to love on today? Can I extend the love of God to somebody that I interact with in the hallways, before church, after church? Can I be loved to that person? If that's your mindset, then awesome. You pass the love test. But if you're somebody who says, you know what, basically I just want to show up for my own consumeristic needs, that for me the church is a place where I can be inspired by some good music, maybe learn a few things and a message, and then slink out the side doors, 
Well, then you're not passing the love test of do you love your brothers and sisters. It's not love, it's consumerism. And I want to tell you that God designed you for so much more. And he designed the church for so much more. You know, I got a pet peeve. Can I tell you about my pet peeve this morning? That's good, because I have the microphone. One of my pet peeves is when people say, I love God, or I love Jesus, but I hate the church. I love God, but I hate the church. I love being spiritual, but I'm not very religious. And you just think, you know, I want you to know at this point that this is an oxymoron in the Bible. It's an oxymoron because the church is deeply loved by God. If you love God, you love the church. The church is called the body of Christ. Christ is the head and the rest of us are the body. So you don't come up to a friend and say, hey, dude, I love your face, but I hate your body. I hate your guts. No, you can't say that. It's, a, it's an oxymoron. The church is also called the bride of Christ. He's the groom. We're the bride. And you can't say to a guy, you know, some dude, hey, dude, I love you, but I hate your ugly wife. And even though it is true, sometimes the church is kind of ugly and kind of broken. But you will not have a good relationship with the dude if you hate his wife. Well, the same thing is true with God. We can't love God and hate the church at the same time. So how are you doing? How are you doing? God designed you for community, and he designed you to express his love here inside the church. Well, John continues on, and he says, Don't be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love each other. And anyone who doesn't love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. It's an interesting comment. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. Don't be surprised. Even if you're totally loving, even if you're extending yourself to your neighbors, your friends in the church, your friends in the workplace, your friends outside of church, there will still be some people who will hate you for it. It goes back to the illustration about Cain and Abel. Cain didn't hate Abel because Abel was the unrighteous one or he was the evil one. He hated Abel because Abel was the righteous one. And the things that were in his heart were so evil that it caused him to hate. Well, the same thing is true about the rest of the world. That oftentimes, hate is extended to people who are so loving because of jealousy or because it reminds them of how evil they are. And so they'll extend hate to you. And you know what you do if you're loving on people and somebody hates you back? Keep on loving them. Love them even more. And Paul says that in so doing, if you love your enemies, it will be like heaping burning coals on their head. And there's something twisted in me that loves loving someone and knowing I'm heaping burning coals on their head all at the same time. Paul says, go ahead and do that. Well, verse 16 continues on and says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for brothers and sisters. Love is not something that is wimpy and passive. Love is something that God has exemplified for us. And I think that God loves it when we get to those times where, like I was earlier this week, where I'm just confessing my junk and I realize I'm wholly inadequate and God says, good, good. Because you are inadequate and you don't have to be adequate. I'll let the righteousness of my son be transferred onto you so that you can walk away scot-free with eternal life. He paid the death price, the death penalty, so that you could walk away with eternal life and power and hope, and you can head in that direction. He did all of the work so that we can get off scot-free. That's love. He laid down his very life for us. He wouldn't even spare his own blood and the physical pain of being tortured on the cross. And he says, now, that's what you do for each other. You lay down your lives for each other. This is what love looks like. And when you are loving God, and when you're loving people to this place where you are laying your lives down for each other, that's when you demonstrate authentic faith. And that's the fuel that fires the belief engine, and it fires the obedience engine. It's the love engine. And God works in them all inside of you to be able to make those things happen. All right. Verse 17, the next verse. He gets a little bit more gritty after this. You know, he starts off with kind of a generic statement, and then he gets really down to the nitty-gritty. He says, this is what love looks like, guys. 
If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So when you do your own self-evaluation, you should ask yourself the question, when is the last time that I saw a brother or sister in need and I gave towards alleviating their needs? When was the last time that I ran into a foster kid or a single mom or a family that was out of a job or had medical needs and I contributed towards their well-being with my own finances? When is the last time that that, that happened? Personally or through the Benevolence Ministry here at Christ Community Church? We all need to do that kind of a self-evaluation to think, is the love in me real in that it's extended financially to other people? And I think we have to ask this question as a church of ourselves as well. Are we the kind of church that's actively engaged in caring for the poor in our city and around the world? And I gotta say, guys, that is one of the things I am so proud of in all of you as a church. One of the things I'm so grateful for that even just this last month, you know, almost $400,000 came in for medical care and food and water for people on the other side of the planet that we have never even met before, and yet people are extending themselves financially to be able to make that happen. That is a beautiful thing, beautiful thing to care for people in Mali. In fact, we have one other opportunity today that we can to continue to extend uh, that blessing to people in Mali. Can I tell you a little bit about that as a... As a uh, uh, application of this message today. And that's this. When Craig and I uh, were in Mali with the team back in May, we discovered something very interesting. Now, in missions, if a mission field like Mali is hitting maturity, there's one really important marker that you'll see. And the important marker is that they raise up their own leaders and then they begin sending out missionaries. When they begin sending out missionaries, that is a sign that they are really maturing. We found out this year that the Malian church is sending out seven missionaries from the Malian church into the other unreached parts of Mali. And we were so excited to be able to hear that that was happening. We asked how it's going. They said, well, in order to fund it, what they do is there's a certain week in September where all of the churches take an offering together, and then that offering funds the seven missionaries that go through Mali. The problem is when you're talking about people who make $1.25 or $1.50 per day, the offering just isn't enough to be able to cover all of their expenses. So we said, well, in September, we will choose a Sunday and take an offering on that Sunday in solidarity with all of the Mali churches, but it's only going to be a $1 offering that matches theirs. So we'll double what their churches give by a $1 offering today. And when you leave today, uh, there's some boxes that say Mali offering on them. I'm encouraging you just to drop $1 for every person in your family. Drop $1 in that box. And, uh, or two or five, but you know, it doesn't have to be a big offering, and that will help to double their offering and take care of those seven missionaries in Mali. Does that sound good to you guys? All right. So that's one application. Another one would be uh, the application of Step Into Village One. Uh, you've heard about that in the announcements today on September 27th. If you've never stepped into North Omaha, into one of the impoverished communities, and just served people, that's the easiest, safest way to dip your toe in the water. And if you want to, we go out every month on the second Saturday serve to be able to serve a different area, a different kind of a group in North Omaha every single month. And our hope is that as Christ community people get into the habit of doing that, you meet some people that you like and you may find a kid to tutor, you may find out about some other financial needs where you'll be able to extend the love of Christ in practical financial ways there. So think about this. John gives a very clear test. He says, hey, you want to know if you're loving? Check yourself out. Do you give material possessions to a brother or sister in need or not? Let's not just love in words or in speech, but in actions and truth. And that summarizes the fullness of the first John spiral here. Believe in Jesus, walk in the light, and live in love. And you want to do an evaluation of yourself and say, is my faith authentic? Is my neighbor's faith authentic? Is that politician's faith authentic? Is that cult leader's faith authentic? Authentic. Put these three tests to bear on them, and you'll be able to have a pretty good idea. So that's all I have to say uh, from 1 John this morning, and I uh, hope that that's been helpful to you. Hope you go back and read those uh, verses. 
What I'd like to do at this point is transition into question and answer. I think the uh, text number has been up there the entire time, so we might be full of questions, but the lines are still open. If you want to keep on asking questions, keep on texting them in. And part of why we do this is that we believe that questions are one of the best ways to help stimulate people's faith. And in all of our different venues, we want to be a place that encourages questions and encourages answers to those good questions. So with no further ado, let's go ahead and see what kind of question that we have and we'll run after it. Okay, how should Christians approach the presidential election when it comes to talking about it and selecting someone to vote for? Wow, that's a great question. Okay. A few thoughts on that. Number one, I would say that it is our duty as Christians to participate and to vote, okay? It is our duty to do that, not only as American citizens, but as Christians. There are so many people all around the world who have no voice in their political system. And when God says, I want you to be salt and light in your culture, when God says, I want you to be somebody who is, a, yeah, I want you to be a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Well, we have the opportunity to influence the entire culture. And so voting is a critical piece of that process. And I'd want to encourage you to go uh, to do your homework and uh, uh, get your votes in. Second thing is do do your homework. Ask yourself the question, what am I looking for? What do I think is critical for the future of this nation? And I would say that for most people, that's not just a single issue. There are some Christians that are single issue voters, but there are a lot of issues that are very important from economics to morality to life to how we interact in a, an international context around the world. And I would ask all of those questions. I would ask the question, what is the faith of the person that I am voting for. Now, I don't think it's the only question that you ask, but I do think that it's a very important question for a Christian, because what somebody's faith is, what their worldview in is, molds their character and it'll mold their decision-making as a president. And so for me, I am more inclined to vote for people who are followers of Jesus. And when you put together all of the issues that are uh, you know, important to you, uh, you put those kinds of things together, you should put your vote in that direction uh, in a way that fits your conscience. I have some favorites in this race, but I can't say them from the stage because uh, promoting candidates is something that is uh, not allowed to do in a church. So anyway, I've got some ideas on that. If you want to talk to me about that personally, I'd be glad to share my opinions personally. But do vote and do uh, put those tests to the candidates. And the last thing I'll just say, do your homework do your homework. Be an informed voter. Whether you're talking about local politics, state politics, national politics, find out what's going on and make your voice heard. I'm convinced if the church just would rise up and vote, we would see a radical transformation in our political system. And one of the great curses on our nation is that Christians stay home and don't vote their conscience, or they vote it, but they do it ignorantly without doing their homework. So do your homework, vote. I'm convinced the Holy Spirit will lead you. Okay. Next one, what's God's point behind allowing some people to have suffering in their lives, like disabilities and deadly diseases, uh, especially when kids or righteous people suffer? It's a great question. And uh, I think the generic answer to that question is, I don't know. I mean, I don't know for any individual person, if you ask me, why did God let this kid get cancer? Why did God have this righteous person die early instead of not die, uh, instead of live a, a long life of righteousness? I don't know over and over and over again with all of those uh, individual people. God's got plans that oftentimes we're able to see in retrospect, and I think from the retrospective of heaven, we'll be able to see amazing, dynamic things that God was doing that are so complex and far-reaching that our little human minds would never be able to track with what's going on there. But I know that what God does do is that in the wake of suffering and pain and evil, God accomplishes an awful lot of good. And I'll give you a little bit of an example. If you were to take a look at your life and you say, good times, bad times, good times, bad times, where does God do the deepest work? He does them in the bad times. And I'd encourage you to take a look at that. It happens again and again and again. Because it's when we're desperate that we turn to God with the most intensity for answers and for growth and for our spiritual lives. And so God will oftentimes take things that are tragedies in this world and use them for spiritual good. And I got to tell you, God's agenda for our lives is not to make us happy and comfortable. 
God's agenda for our lives is to make us mature. And sometimes when we're given pain, we're actually given pain as a huge gift in order to keep us close to God, in order to make us spiritually mature. And so God takes all of these trials uh, and temptations and he uses them for his good. Uh, That's why James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter trials and temptations of various kinds. Because the trials and the suffering, they produce character and character endurance and endurance hope. There are things that are intangible and you can't put a price tag on that God only does during the times of suffering in our lives. And more important than that, he just draws us close to himself. Uh, When things are going well, it's very easy for us to just keep chugging down the path, accelerating our speed and ignoring God. But when things are challenging in our lives, that's when we slow down and turn to God, and that's got a huge value in God's book, and when you look for all eternity, that's the most important thing anyway. All right, what does God think about marriage after divorce? Wow, someone's setting me up to be like drop kicked and punted across the room on this one. What does God think about marriage uh, after divorce? Okay, so there's some uh, very challenging passages in the Bible that probably, uh, I'll just say, I'm not going to do an adequate job of unpacking during this, you know, little one-minute session that I have here. Uh, One of them is a passage that says that God hates divorce. God hates divorce because it rips up families, it tears up kids, it does all kinds of damage in this world. God hates when divorce happens. Now, there are a few exceptions that are in the Bible related to divorce, adultery for sure, Uh, um, abandonment is one, and many people think abuse would be the third one that would be there, that we could say we can make a biblical argument for uh, those three reasons uh, for divorce to happen. And uh, the question is, if it was a biblical divorce, what are the chances for remarriage? Because Jesus says some pretty strong things himself uh, about marriage, uh, being married after being divorced, causing somebody to commit adultery. And does that mean perpetual adultery? Like every time you're with that person, it's an adulterous act? Or is it the first time it's adultery, and then after that, you're now married to this person and it's no longer an adulterous act? And I'll just say, Christians disagree on that statement, on whether or not it's perpetual adultery to be divorced and remarried. There's some who would say yes, there's some who would say no. My general inclination on this is not to draw hard and fast rules related to it. Uh, I think that there's enough ambiguity that's in the Bible that I can't say, look, the Bible gives really clear answers as to which situations are right and which are wrong. I think that we just need to uh, take inventory of ourselves and uh, of a particular situation and pray and ask for God's grace to be in that situation to know what the wise thing to do is. Because sometimes I think that it's wise for somebody who's divorced to stay divorced. I think sometimes it's wise for somebody uh, who's divorced to have the opportunity to get married again. And there's a lot of case by case uh, that happens in that. And uh, without getting into too much detail, I think that's the closest answer I can come to. One of the things I'll say along with this is that I believe that our culture has developed a culture of divorce and remarriage that's way too easy. Way too easy to get divorced, way too easy to get remarried, and that as a culture we would be much better off if we worked on our junk inside of our first marriage and we allowed that to be a sanctifying process for both individuals in the marriage and that you learn to love each other even though you're both ridiculously bad sinners. That's part of why God has created marriage is to put you up close and personal with a ridiculously bad sinner and then uh, cause you to change your character as a result of being in proximity to that person. So uh, that's, a, that's a way too short and inadequate answer, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it there because I know that there's way too many complexities to deal with on that. Okay, how can you stay encouraged when it comes to loving people when everyone around you is so negative? Well, a couple of things. One of the things that's interesting is uh, uh, that David would go off and uh, David, when he would be depressed and everything would be negative, this was back in the time before David was the king, he was being chased by Saul from cave to cave, all of his armies were deserting him, there was all kinds of problems. It would say that David would go and encourage himself in the Lord. Encourage himself in the Lord. And what he found is that encouragement came from, not from life's situations, but encouragement came from his vertical relationship with God. 
And the number one place that we can find encouragement is from our connection with God. God is the ultimate source of infinite love. And as we pour out love on other people, the place that we can go back to to receive more love is you go straight to God and he fills you up regardless of how negative people are around you. Second answer I'd give to that is by drinking in God's word and allowing this to be able to shape your mind. There's all kinds of forces in culture that shape your mind. You watch too much news at any given time and you'll be filled up with so much depression that you will not want to be a positive person. But if you fill yourself up with God's word and what he teaches us, all of a sudden you'll find your tank full and you're able to uh, extend yourself in encouraging ways. The third thing would be to put yourself around people who are encouraging people. So if you say everyone around you is so negative, that's too many, that's way too high a percentage. So you gotta find yourself some people around you who are not negative people, and you have gotta allow them to fill your tank, get, your, get them in your life part of the time. If you're not a part of a journey group here at Christ Community, get into a journey group. I promise you everyone in the journey group won't be negative. All right, I'm not saying there's not some exceptions out there. Okay. If everything is set in stone, then what is the purpose of prayer? Oh, I love this question. If everything's set in stone, so the idea is if God has sovereignly put together every moment of history from creation all the way to redemption, all the way to the consummation of when Jesus is gonna come again, well, why pray? And if you go along with that, you even say, why have any good actions? Why make good choices? Why do positive things? It was all predetermined anyway, so we're just kind of victims that are floating along in a life that God pre-created. And the truth of the matter is, or what I believe is, I don't think that God determined everything from beginning to end. I think that God has given human beings a free will that is an authentic free will to be able to choose to rebel against him or to do the right things. And I believe that prayer has two key purposes. One is I think that prayer changes the person who, the, who is the prayer. I think when you come before God and you allow him to be in your life and you talk to him about things that are on your mind and you listen to him or things that are on his mind, you walk away a different person. So prayer is critical to change your perspective so that you can make real choices in this life that really make a difference. But I also believe that prayer in our relationship with God really is effective. So James says that the prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. And I believe that they're not only effective in the life of the prayer, I believe that they extend beyond the prayer. And I have seen God do amazing things when prayers get offered. There is a huge correlation. When people pray for opportunities to be a witness for Jesus, they get opportunities to be a witness for Jesus. I've seen miraculous healings happen in people's lives, but I've never seen a miraculous healing if nobody's praying for it. Doesn't just automatically happen. It happens when God opens up the floodgates of heaven. Now, God doesn't answer every prayer in the way that we want it to be answered, but I believe that God's answers to prayer are very real, and it's a part of the relational nature of God. Can you imagine if God was utterly unchangeable and stone-faced, and we come to him in prayer and we ask for things, and there's absolutely no value in that? That's not a relationship. That's not much different than going to a stone idol. No, God is a God who loves us and he wants to come to us and his relationship with us is authentic. And friends, I wanna tell you, your prayers matter. They matter in your lives, they matter in our country, they matter in the trajectory of other people's lives. So we need to be people of prayer because it's not all set in stone. Now there are some things that are set in stone. Like there's some things that God promises in the Bible that are gonna happen. Like when he said, I'm gonna send a Messiah to come to the planet, it was gonna happen. No matter what people chose, God was gonna make that happen. Right now when he says, Jesus is gonna come back again and set everything right, that's gonna happen no matter what choices you and I make. But I think that there is flexibility in world history depending on what we decide. Now God can foreknow what we decide without determining what we decide. And I think that's what really happens in the pattern of life. Someday when we have a long seminar, I'll talk about how I think that happens. But I believe that God foreknows our decisions, but they are legitimately our decisions, and that things really do change in this world based on our actions and based on our prayers. I didn't even get one clap for that one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, 1 John talks about loving people in the church, but what about people outside of the church? Yeah, you know, uh, that's a great question. Um, 
if you take a, a broader look at the Bible, and it really is true that in 1 John, he usually talks about loving your brother or sister, which is talking about inside of the church, and that's an important application. But the Bible talks about loving your neighbor as yourself. The top command is to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And neighbor is not just people who are in the Christian family. Neighbor is anybody that God puts you in proximity to. You guys may remember that uh, the, the Pharisee asked Jesus when he said that, yeah, but who is my neighbor? And that's when Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, it could be any old guy that you run into who has a need, and you share financially with that person, you love them, you get them on the donkey and put them in the uh, inn, uh, that's your neighbor. So anybody that God has put you into relational proximity with, that's who you love. In fact, the Bible says that that's going to be the marker of how the rest of the world knows us. It'll know us by our love for each other, and it will know us by our love for them. And if we're so overwhelmingly overpowered by the love of God that lives inside of us, extended to all people around us, it will be the most attractive thing that we can do to a watching world to help them want to uh, be a part of what we're doing. All right, last question here. What do we do when we get to heaven? What do we do when we get to heaven? We float on clouds with little harps that we strum. And we sing ancient hymns over and over and over again. Anybody afraid of that? Anybody afraid of that? Like, I'm, I, when I was a teenager, I was afraid of that. I was like, oh, dude, I do not want to go to heaven if it's going to be the eternal bummer. Right? Uh, and there's, there's a, a line, oh, gosh. I'm forgetting it. There's a line from a Billy Joel song uh, about, uh, I can't say it right, so I won't say it at all. Anyway, uh, what are we going to do in heaven is the question that people are asking here. And this is a great question. So, number one, in heaven, you get a new body, okay? In heaven, you get a new body, and it's going to be a super body. It's not like the bodies that we have today that are breaking down and need glasses and knee surgery and all those other kinds of things. We get the super body that God designed us to have all the way from the beginning, and he talks about that. 1 Corinthians 15 uh, talks about that body, and other places talk about that body, so that's going to be awesome, Number two, you get jobs in heaven. You get jobs in heaven. So Revelation uh, chapters 21 and 22 is one of the best, most compelling pictures of what you do in heaven. But it's a picture where everybody's got different roles assigned to them according to what God has created them to do. So you get to do in heaven what you were most created to do. I know not everybody believes this, but when God created us all the way in Genesis, he created us with the idea that work is good. Did you know that? Work is good. Work was there before there was the fall of humanity, and work isn't going to be there with us forever. But the difference is we won't have the curse, which the curse brought all of the, you know, the thorns and the thistles and the weeds and the soil that you have to work the ground. Work is going to be an utter joy where we're kind of in the flow of what God's doing in the world. So everybody's going to have an important role that's in heaven. We know that in heaven there is going to be worship. But it's not going to be a lame, like, sitting on a cloud, strumming the harps type of worship. I want you to imagine a multi-ethnic, worldwide, history-wide fellowship of people rocking it out with God straight in the middle of it. It's going to be the type of thing that we'll be able to endure for a long, long time because God says every tongue, every tribe, every nation will gather together in worship of the Lamb who sits on the throne. That's going to be a ball, isn't it? We're also going to have relationships in heaven. We're going to have relationships in heaven. So the Bible talks about different opportunities that we have not only to relate to God, but to be able to relate to other people in heaven. And we know there's going to be some kind of leadership and authority that happens in the next life. We're not exactly sure of what that looks like, but Jesus talks about different crowns and jewels and authorities that we'll be able to have in heaven. He talks about in the parable in Matthew chapter 25 about being put in charge of cities based on how faithful you were with the stuff that you had on planet Earth. Now, what does all of that mean? I don't really know, but I know that there's going to be authority that's given out in heaven. So when you think about it, you get work, you get worship, you get relationships, you get a brand new body, and there's going to be food in heaven. Did you know that? There's going to be food. It talks about heaven being like the great feast. And it talks about the tree of the river that's grown up on both sides of the river of life that gives fruit in every single season. It is a rich banquet that's going to be filled with beauty 
and abundance and order. The three things that got wrecked in the garden, beauty became ugly, abundance became scarcity, order became chaos. All those things are going to be restored in heaven. And dudes, I'm telling you, it is going to be awesome. Awesome. All right, the dudes in the back are telling me it's time for me to sit down, so why don't you guys stand, and uh, we'll have some closing prayer. Let me remind you, as you leave the rooms, look for those little boxes that say Molly Offering, and drop a buck a person uh, into those boxes so that we can support missionaries on the other side of the world and have a quick application to what we're doing with First John here today. All right, let's pray. God, we're so thankful. We're so thankful for what you've given us. We're thankful for your spirit, We're thankful for the life that Jesus has given us by dying on the cross. And uh, we're thankful for 1 John and for the things that we've learned here. Will you help us, God, to believe the right things, to have our minds set on the things that Jesus' mind is set on? Will you help us, Lord, to do the right things, to walk in the light, to obey your commands? And will you help us, God, to be a congregation of love? that extends that not only to other people in the congregation, but to a watching and waiting world, to our neighbors and to our friends and even to the ends of the earth. God, we love you and we want to represent you well, so we pray that you would do your deep work in us and through us for your glory's sake. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you all.